Um, and today I'm going to talk about uh, what I've been working on the past uh, uh, four months or so. This project actually started um, way before the EPF. Uh, I've been working on uh, uh, Ethereum uh, on a different research branch, branch for nearly a year and a half. And as a, as a result of that research, um, I got an idea of um, um, of a further um, um, implementation, further work that could be done um, as, as a result from from, from that uh, the first phase of the research. So really, today what I'm going to be talking about is uh, this new uh, feature that allows the validator to to update their, um, their their signing key, and I'll explain why it's as important. Um, and uh, there's a lot of um, security questions um, that are still unanswered, and I'll, I'll go through that as well. And um, and, and what's also what it means generally on the security for um, uh, for Ethereum blockchain. Um, so really, the goal of the the project was to um, understand the feasibility of um, um, of of this new PubKey feature and see whether how easy it is and um, and, and understand um, whether there's any implications uh, to having such feature um, deployed in the near future because because there's so many moving parts and the the keys are being used so many different places and obviously it's quite crucial to to understand um, that you know what changing one area does not necessarily break uh, uh, another moving part essentially. Um, so, so that was the, the second um, objective of the, uh, uh, of, the of, uh, of the project uh, is to try to do a, like a simple proof of concept. Uh, and for this, I used a, um, a PySpec um, um, written in, um, uh, in in Python to just do a very quick implementation to to, to understand um, for me to understand what's happening and also um, to, to 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 test whether it's achievable um, uh, and really. Uh, the, the purpose is to, um, uh, to reduce any opportunity for, for an attacker to basically um, um, basically leverage the uh, the slashing mechanism as a, a method to uh, extort money, extort money from victims essentially. Um, so in our attacker model, obviously, um, we kind of assume that. Um, um, so in, the, in, the, in our talk model, obviously, being able to prove firstly that they actually have compromised the key. Because if I was to just come approaching approach you and say, hey, by the way, give me $200 because uh, I've somehow able to um, compromise the signing key, no one would believe it. So it, it, the, the, the model sort of relies on um, um, the, the proof of ownership of that compromised signing key. And then once that, once that is, is, is compromised, um, uh, this, this, sorry, I couldn't have um, So once that's been compromised, the attackers basically go like three possible outcomes. So that's when the, the extortion game really begins. And that's when you've got this negotiation back and forth happening between the, 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 the attacker and the victim. And really based on, you know, once, once that proof, once the ownership is proven, then there's only these three things that can happen really is firstly, is the target could simply just uh, assign to exit, which they wouldn't really, because there's no any gain for them to do that. Um, and, and secondly is, um, sorry, the, the first is the, from, from the victims, we're talking about from the validators perspective, sorry. Is, so from the validators perspective, it's got three possible outcomes. So firstly, is as soon as he realizes that um, uh, the compromise just, Basically, exit, you know, um, or or it would be refused and get slashed. And as soon as you get slashed, then obviously you're uh, on an exit queue for 30, 36 days, um, approximately. But and be, and within those thirty six days, you still you still you still get penalties, right? And you'll still be slashed. So if I put your key and I keep on signing, you'll still be slashed. So you still keep on losing money, essentially. Or the last one is pay the ransom. And the, the last part is, is also very tricky because, um, uh, which I'll discuss a bit later, um, uh, because um, these, um, um, these, um, there's no way of, of stopping validating the attacker to come back and, and basically demand more money, right? So that's a big problem. And there is, needs to be aware where if the victim has paid the ransom, then, then, then they're allowed to successfully exit, 
without any, any further penalties. So that's very crucial uh, in, the, in the model. Uh, so really the key benefit here uh, of having the, 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 the key update uh, feature is that um, the, the compromise validator does not uh, you know, need to exit the thinking chain, essentially, because the, um, you know, I'm think, uh, um, from, um, from, a, from, a, um, from a business perspective, because validating is all business, right? Uh, the longer you are um, on, an, on an exit queue and you're not performing your duties, lose money, which, which is obviously not great. Um, so having this feature will just basically allow um, the validators to uh, just change their key without having to exit. Um, and also it increases the availability of validators because now uh, if, if, if a validator's key is compromised, they don't need to exit, right? which means it increases the um, uh, the integrity then and availability and also the um, the overall uh, security of, of Ethereum uh, blockchain uh, essentially because now you always have validators who are going to be there um, and uh, doing their job rather than uh, having to exit because the keys are compromised and uh, lastly the any period of inactivity we're looking at opportunity loss um, so any you know loss in pot potential reward while performing the the validators duty. So this there there are obviously many of the benefits that and this is high level kind of sort of um, summary of um, some of the important main um, key um, uh, benefits. So really how it works is uh, as soon as the the validator um, uh, ha, um, ha, while just kind of signing key has been compromised. Uh, then uh, really you know, there's going to be uh, two, two, two conditions. Um, so the, 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 the two conditions here is basically um, um, is that um, the, so, so what are the conditions of, for, this, for this to work? Firstly, it needs to be something unique. The key needs to be unique. You can't use the, the current signing key uh, because I believe, um, correct me if I'm wrong, for voluntary exits, you could basically use a public key. To, 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 to sign a validator exit, right? But you can't really use here because we are assuming that hackers already got access to that, that key, right? So uh, we need something unique that has not been previously been used. And the only thing is the validator withdrawal key, assuming that that's been still safe offline and uh, it hasn't been accessed, right? So, so those, are, those are conditions of, of how this, this key would work is we're gonna have to use something unique uh, that's, uh, that's uh, that has to be compromised. Um, so um, really the goal, uh, as I previously mentioned, was to try to uh, get inside of the development process, try to understand the consensus, um, and try to do some simple implementation of, um, of, of, of this feature. Now, this is very, very um, a basic proof of concept, but obviously there's a lot of other security concerns that uh, needs to be addressed, which uh, we'll go on to the later slides. Uh, but really, I had to um, uh, uh, I had to sort of modify the current Pi spec um, and add uh, new functions. Um, this is just a few of few of the important ones I had to add that would allow this this update to happen. There's a lot of other uh, definitions that were included in, in various parts to basically facilitate uh, this um, this change. And I've got a GitHub um, uh, link here where I've been pushing some updates. It needs to be tidied up a bit because uh, it's a little bit messy, but uh, hopefully in the next week or so, uh, there should be um, a, a nice update with, uh, with a nice uh, working feature with the test case as well. So the last part is the test case to just basically check that the key has been changed. So you're basically checking the old key with the new key and, and, and just making sure they're all the same. A very simple test case. But again, uh, the purpose is to um, uh, just to try something quick and fail and learn from it. Um, so challenges were um, just uh, there's more, there's a lot more challenges than what I put here. But some of it is obviously um, the ability to update the smart contract. So I was speaking to uh, to the manager and uh, you know we got the VLS keys and we got the one address keys and uh, and and. Those, those, the withdrawal keys are embedded in the smart contract. So instead of a validator, it's a smart contract and it's all captured. So uh, it's, it's, the case of, it's the case of then how do we make sure that the new key is linked to this new, is linked to the original withdrawal key, essentially. So, so that's an interesting challenge that we need to look at um, uh, and explore, ex explore that in a little bit more detail. 
And then the last part is uh, uh, even a bigger challenge because um, the key, the, the, the public key is used in a lot of different areas. So we need to make sure that uh, uh, you know the, the enrollment um, uh, of the um, um, to, so the real mentor or the effective validators um, uh, it doesn't break the other moving parts basically in the ecosystem. Um, and uh, so just to summarize some of the unanswered questions, this is just some of them. Um, there's a lot of more um, which you know just having discussions uh, kind of found out and I've added lot, lots to this list. Um, so it's great to get you know, ideas and, um, and, and and make this list a bit longer because it just means that uh, there's a lot of other things that uh, to, to think about um, for for this project. And uh, in the final report, um, I'm hoping to sort of uh, sort of uh, answer uh, this uh, some of these questions. So, firstly, what happens um, in a particular epoch? For example, um, uh, a key has been changed, um, then. Then, 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 and at the same epoch, or say, for example, an exit is initiated as well. Then, then, what happens? What are the implications of that? The other one is penalties. You know, I, I'm in a particular epoch, and then, and I say, I want to update my, my, my key, and then a later epoch, you find out oh, actually slashing has happened. So there needs to be a way of, 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 of having that history to say, okay, this has changed, but this is your old key was found to do something, something miscellaneous. So you will be you will be um, charged with, with that penalty. So you need to have that. So is, is it, that that's going to be a, a lot more challenge. And also then we have the other security implications as a staking pool. Now um, staking pool, I think um, I've kind of um, I was speaking uh, to Manuel and uh, I'm kind of um, uh, happy with that element in the sense that um, the low staking pools they will set up their own validators. So you basically create a smart contract, you give them the it. And then they will manage the keys for you. So in that sense, it's actually better because the, the issue is that uh, if it's a delegated, then what if the client changes the key? Um, because, they, because they'll have the withdrawal, right? Um, so, so that's an issue in the staking pool. Um, so yeah, we need to carry further tests to obviously test the, um, the, the this new feature. Um, and the the other one is the the validator cache um, on the client side. Um, which I need to look into a little bit more detail, and implication of the sync committee. Now, this was just something that was raised last week to me. I didn't even think about this, um, and it's a very interesting, um, um, uh, interesting problem because sync committees are 27 hours long. So then, um, what do we do? Do we just uh, um, basically inactivate um, attack always in sync committee to not be able to change the key for 27 hours? Or, um, or, or um, yeah, what other solutions can basically employ here to, 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 to mitigate that? So, yeah, very, very interesting um, questions that security questions that need to be answered before this obviously feature would, would even would even come to uh, close to being applied. Um, and um, and yeah, it's it's uh, it's very um, uh, exciting, um, uh, it's exciting work. So that kind of concludes my um, my presentation. And I'm obviously happy to take questions. And uh, if you feel like you have any other issues I could think about, please let me know. I'll be, I'll be so curious to to basically um, 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 have, have further discussion on that. So yeah, thank you for your time and for listening. And yeah, take, happy to take any questions. One comment, it's great presentation. I think like, there's one thing that might make your life easier is that um, for the public state kitchen, there, we're moving in towards more like in political deposit measure. So therefore, it's kind of similar to withdraw. We don't need the deposit contract anymore, so they might make a little bit. Yeah, but just one comment. On yeah, no, I think the withdrawal. I think it was just I'm in a chat earlier, and if the withdrawal window could be reduced to to like a, say a couple of hours, then you don't really need to have this implementation. But the problem is, withdrawal could also it it also takes longer. Which means that the longer your key is being compromised, then yeah. then you still be you, you still this is still going to be an issue basically. So until that window is completely narrowed down to a couple of hours, yeah. then then yes, then then you can just exit basically, and, and then you can just restart a new validator. But the fact that because it's a queue, and there's that prolonged wait, yeah. that which means for for a um, for, for a validator um, for any business who is running new validators, it's a problem basically.
Any other comments, questions online? Uh, so, apart from the withdrawals are genuine, uh, the, the attacker can really slash me, and the attacker will not have any incentive to earn money. Yeah, exactly. After the withdrawals. Exactly, yeah. After the withdrawals. Well, well, withdrawals, even if the withdrawals are, are, are implemented uh, with the Shanghai upgrade, the problem, the, the thing is because in order to have the stability, they obviously have to have this queuing system. Um, and and it's, it's, it, the queuing system could basically mean that you could be in the queue. Before you get to front, it could be like a long waiting list, basically. And that's the window where the attacker will play that game to extract ransom from you. Um, and uh, um, and, and, and um, uh, un unless that window is shortened, where well, it's a couple of hours, then it reduces the, 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 the attack very, very significantly. So a couple of hours is very difficult for, you might get slashed once, but that's it really. Because as soon as you get slashed, you're in exit queue. Right, but the problem is, you, I could, the attacker could slash you and you could be executed, but you could still be penalized whilst being on the queue and that's the issue. So, um, so, yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the Thank you so much for the All right, hey everybody. Um, I'm Echo, and I'm here to talk to you about data availability sampling and creating simulations uh, within local environments to try to figure out some possible uh, solutions to passing around this new set of data that is going to be uh, needed whenever data sharing comes around. Um, so yeah, what is data availability sampling? Uh, data availability sampling is basically this process of an individual being able to ask another individual uh, whether whether data is put on chain or not without uh, the person asking the question, having to download all of the data in order for uh, them to know that all of the data is available. Um, and so why do we need it? We need it for uh, blob data or blobs um, that Layer two scaling solutions are able to prove to uh, prove to individuals that uh, they've made some off-chain computation and that they're not lying. And uh, this blob data allows people to, with fraud proofs, verify that people aren't lying. And with uh, zk uh, snark layer two things, uh, zero knowledge proofs, they're able to reconstruct. Uh, information that they need to reconstruct. Okay, so how do we make this happen? That is the question. That is the DOS networking problem. Um, uh, yeah, and we need to have peer-to-peer uh, -peer networks that are fast, that are privacy preserving, and are civil resistant. Um, and I basically just kind of stumbled upon the DOS networking problem and heard from Dankrad about a possible solution and just kind of picked it up and ran with it. But it's the possible solution is to uh, create a secure Kademlia DHT uh, on top of disk v5 overlay network. Um, so yeah, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> it took me a while to figure that out. Um, yeah, so basically a secure Kademlia DHT overlay network uh, is kind of like this, this these two uh, sub protocols built on top of disk v5 uh, using disk v5's talk request, talk response, um, like functionality. Uh, and you're able to, in the best case scenario, have a sub network, the main DOS network, uh, pass around information. Any individual can really just kind of go in and pass around samples and other information needed. Uh, and if that network were to come under attack, because distributed hash tables are really easy to attack, um, there's a secondary network that uh, only validators are allowed to participate in sharing information and everyone else just kind of has to uh, 
rely on the validators passing around information to get uh, data availability sampling stuff. Um, and the cool thing about the secure uh, overlay network is that validators are just incentivized to make sure things are running smoothly, or at least a lot more incentivized than uh, a random anonymous uh, person. Uh, and a few things to note, um, yeah, each, each of these, uh, the overlay networks and disk v5, uh, they all have different routing tables. Uh, well, the secure and overlay protocols will have similar stuff, but, um, but yeah, they're, they're all their own, uh, DHTs and, uh, yeah. So what I've been doing, uh, over the past few months is kind of trying to create a simulation to, to see what it is or see how the, the overlay networks, uh, how they kind of like dance with each other. Um, and I originally tried to uh, create this secondary overlay uh, routing table within uh, Eric and Timothy's uh, DOS prototype repository. It's like a, a pretty complex uh, Rust simulation uh, that kind of just tinkers with uh, data availability sampling uh, things, mostly related to like, querying uh, samples. Um, but yeah, so I tried to implement the secure overlay network within their repository and realized that I was new to networking in general and new to Rust and needed to chill out and take like an intermediate step. So I built DOS Playground. Um, and it's just this, uh, a simple simulation that instantiates these protocol structs between nodes, uh, and so, yeah, I've, I've gotten the discovery protocol and both uh, overlay subnetwork protocols um, instantiated and message processing and just like simple communication between these local peers. Uh, and the next thing to do is to uh, put my big boy pants on and, and make this uh, make this secondary overlay network happen in uh, Eric and Timothy's or forked version of Eric and Timothy's. Uh, so yeah, and so yeah, you, the, with the idea being to measure uh, performance on how these uh, two networks communicate, and so yeah, uh, that's that's it for now. Um, but I want to thank Mario and Josh first of all for letting me like letting this happen and making this happen for me. Um, and I wanted to thank Clara, who was like my first friend in crypto. Whenever I was trying to build like a light client bridge in Python, she was the first person that was like, hey, I can help you out. Came and came along uh, and he became my first in real life friend uh, through the Ethereum world. Uh, and then Eric kind of uh, was a bridge between Cayman and Timothy and he's been very kind. And Timothy was just like leading this uh, this DOS prototype simulation and was huge in being able to answer all sorts of questions, like dumb questions that I had turning into better questions uh, as time went on. But yeah, just a lot of patience and love and appreciate them all. And thanks for everything, guys. <laughs> Are there any questions? Any plans to apply this on top of the IoT way for, for the blob network? I think that would be pretty really cool. Ah, I haven't thought about that. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I will. Yeah, we'll talk. <laughs> um, anyone else? Yeah, thanks everybody. <laughs> and thank you, Piper, for, for making this the overlay protocol happen. <laughs> Thank you so much again. Yeah. 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 Uh, thanks everyone for showing up. Uh, my name is Ekno, uh, or Daniel, and my project was to reduce the trust assumptions in the PBS relay. Yeah. So that's my agenda. Uh, so first off, what is the PBS even? It's proposal separation, proposal builder separation, sorry. 
Uh, so you have the validator and you split them now into two entities, the builder and the proposer. And why is that? It was kind of a market force because the proposer has an incentive to, to um, outsource their block construction because of MEV. So these builders are often like um, highly sophisticated, have like a lot of good algorithms to extract MEV. And so they bid against one another to get in included in the proposal's slot. And also uh, there's, it's needed for dang sharding because um, yeah, in, in dang sharding we have these uh, roughly 16 megabyte uh, blobs. And so the, the builder has to have like high bandwidth requirements and the rest of the network just needs to verify their data availability to something, which you've just heard of. Uh, um that the data is available and that doesn't require a lot of bandwidth and computational power so we need these um, uh, like highly sophisticated uh, builders for that yeah and like most people think that's like a um pos it's like a future th thing but it's already there and um, there's an out of protocol pbs solution uh, which is displayed here. So we have these um, different kind of builders which construct uh, a block and they send this full block to the relay with uh, a bit. Um, and the bit is just how much it's worth for them to be included in the proposal slot. And now the relay picks the highest bit from the builder and sends it off to MEV Boost. And MEV Boost is just a program that's operated by the proposer. And MEV Boost selects um, the most profitable block from all the relays. So there are multiple relays, it's just not one. Um, but they're all like centralized. And then, oh, oh sorry, and the relay sends the header, not the full block, to the, uh, to the proposal or to MEV Boost. And then the proposal signs this uh, block header and sends it back to the relay. And the relay then releases the whole block to the network. So this has some trust assumptions. Um, the first one is that, of course, the relay can see the whole block content, so the whole transactions. And as I said, there's, there could be MEV included. And the relay could just um, tamper with the block content to kind of generate this MEV for themselves. So the builder needs to trust the relay that they are not doing that. And as I said, the relay is releasing the block, not the builder, not the proposer, but the relay. So uh, the proposal needs to trust the relay to actually release the block on time. Uh, so the proposal is not missing out on any uh, proposing rewards. Uh, also, the relay can uh, can censor different blocks. So for example, uh, with the uh, tornado cache, if there's like a tornado cache transaction uh, inside the inside the block, they could just say, no, I'm not, I'm not forwarding that block. Uh, I, don't want, I don't want to. And also the, the last one is that it's unbiased in uh, bit selection. So for example, there are relay operators that, that are also operating builders and they could be biased to just se always select their uh, block that their own builder constructed. <coughs> so, so what's the proposed approach uh, for PBS? So first off, the, both the builder and the proposer need to a register uh, before the proposal slot on an uh, on-chain contract and the builder also needs to stake some amount of ETH. Oh, okay. Oh, that's not good. Uh, LibreOffice, nice. <laughs> Just try to show it like like this. Okay. Yeah, I'll just show it like this. Um, so, so the first step in this is that the builder is sending the signed uh, the block header and the bit to the intermediary. So it's important that this approach does not um, dictate what intermediary is used. So it could be a rollup, it could be a modified version of the MEV boost relay or it could be a data availability layer. And uh, yeah, so all of those could be used. And now the, yeah, the, the builder sends the block header. So not the whole block, that's important. 
So in the other approach before, the whole block was sent to the relay, and now we only send the header with the bit. And the proposal then can select the best bit uh, from the intermediary and receive the header. So uh, and in the relay approach, the, the relay kind of chose what, uh, which builder to choose. And now the proposal does it. And the proposal then signs the block header and sends it back to the intermediary. And the builder then retrieves the uh, signed header and releases the block to the network. Yeah, so as you can see here, uh, opposed to the approach that's currently used, the intermediary never knows about the block content. And also the builder here is releasing the block on their own, so not the relay anymore. Yeah. Okay, try to go back to the forum. Yeah, and oh, never mind actually. Um, so, as you can see here, what, what guarantees are there that the builder actually releases the block on time? So the builder could just brief the proposer by uh, just not releasing the block and the proposer then misses out on the block reward uh, or just not pay the bill. So for that, we need like these extra slashing conditions, uh, which are that the, um, yeah, if, if the builder didn't release the block on time or the Builder submitted an invalid block, could also happen. Um, or the builder didn't pay the promised fees. And the first one could be proven to be um, through, uh, we could assume that the builder always doesn't submit the block on time or an invalid block, and then kind of say, hey, you need to include a transaction in your block that it's a call, uh, and it calls a function in the slashing contract to kind of say, hey, this block is valid because if it wasn't, then you wouldn't be able to call this function. Uh, I'm, uh, I know it's kind of maybe kind of hard to get, but uh, yeah, if, if you uh, need me to uh, repeat it, just uh, say it at the end. And also, there's the that the block uh, that the builder didn't pay the promised fees. That's just done by uh, the builder needs to send the fee to the slashing contract, and there is like this challenge period. Uh, where if the builder didn't pay in that amount of time, then the proposal can slash it. Okay, um, so they are now like, uh, these are the reduced trust assumptions now. Uh, as I told you already, the, uh, the intermediary never knows about the full block and content, so the intermediary cannot censor the block based on the content that's inside, and also it cannot tamper with the content because it doesn't have the content. Um, so for like the relay and the rollup as the intermediary, we're left with two, two trust assumptions, which are the uh, intermediary does not collude with the proposer. So um, yeah, for example, the uh, proposer and the intermediary can collude to slash the build around fairly in that case. And the intermediary does not, does not censor transactions. So for example, the, the intermediary could still not forward uh, the, the bills uh, based on some arbitrary uh, uh, reasons. Are there some different, there are some other trade-offs than just trust assumptions? So, um, for example, spam protection. Uh, for example, the roll-up could have some uh, spam protection built in, where the builders need to pay bids, uh, pay fees to the intermediary, to the, to the person or the organization that runs the intermediary. And yeah, that could be used as spam protection. And there's also latency to uh, consider. So, um, uh, yeah, the, the latency kind of depends on the intermediary to, you choose. Because, for example, really might be faster than a data availability layer. And um, the and also the builder need to stake that they need to stake is like a hurdle to entry. So it's kind of difficult to say how much you need to stake because it can't be. Uh, too much because then it's a hurdle to entry for new builders, but it also can't be too less because um, it should be at least the amount of um, of ETH that the builder is paying as a bit to the proposer. Oh, uh, oh yeah, and we can uh, uh, introduce an additional DA layer for the rollup and relay just to 
reduce trust assumptions even further. Of course, if you use the DA as the intermediary, you don't need the extra DA. Uh, yeah, and that would uh, result in removing that heavy trust assumption that the um, that the proposal and the intermediary can pollute uh, because the DA could attest to that the, the, that the data was available at the time. Uh, and yeah, some future work includes like a search or builder market, uh, restaking, sort of eigen there, um, a dynamic staking amount. So the builder could just, uh, we, we wouldn't dictate how, what the stake is, how much they would need to stake. The, the proposer can just choose how much risk it's worth for them uh, to take um, with the builder of how much they have staked. And there could be some extra slashing conditions like inclusion lists. Um, yeah, and that's it. Oh, any questions? Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. That's uh, the header needs to be signed, right? I don't think so. No. That's cur it's currently also not done. The, currently, also the uh, the proposal is only signing the header. It's like a blinded block. Uh, it's called. Right now, the proposal asks for the header to enter. The proposal has signed, and he likes the signed header to the. Yeah. Yeah, they give they give the full block to the network, right? Yeah. Sure. They should give the full block to the They should broadcast it, but they should be turning back the proposal. The proposal is broadcast. So so why not they do both? Yeah. 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 So and together. Yep. Oh yeah, sure. Um so what they can do is um so all of these intermediaries are basically just there for data availability. So and let's now say I have a I have the roll up for example. And so the proposer kind of sends the uh, kind of says to the uh, rollup to we, we can we can collude to, to the with the uh, we can collude to slash the builder unfairly. And what they would do is just not provide the signed header to the builder, but kind of attest to it that the signed header was available at that time. So these are like all the like kind of trusted entities to attest to the availability of. Uh, of the signed header, and if they just say, "Yeah, it was available," but if, if it wasn't at the time, they could pollute and slash the builder uh, for not releasing the block on time, for example. Yeah. Talk about Ethereum Beacon Chain. It's quite important to have some kind of interoperability between. Uh, uh, client implementations, for, for example, um, create a Teku validator client can connect to Lighthouse Beacon Node and Lighthouse validator client can connect to Teku Beacon Node, but with Prism it wasn't totally the case. Mm -hmm. And so the, the purpose of this uh, topic is to rewrite the Prism validator client code to be compatible with the Beacon API instead of Prismatic Lab Internalized API. Beacon API is an official API defined. Uh, the specification, uh, which is a HTTP API, and we try to use it right now. Uh, so fellows were Pat Pavignon, uh, Groove, which is not here, and me, and mentors were Radek. Radek uh, gave a talk uh, two weeks ago uh, on Tuesday, and James from Prism team. And uh, so before the fellowship, so we had multiple case. So here we have the valid, Prism validator client, which can communicate with Prism Beacon Node, but only by using a gRPC request, which is an internal 
gRPC implementation in Prism. And for example, if you want a non-Prism non validator client like Deku to communicate with Prism backend node, uh, so it's possible. So non-Prism validator client can um, send a HTTP vegan IPL request to the Prism backend node. But the Prism backend node has to convert it into gRPC requests to be correctly handled. So this was the situation before the fellowship, which was not possible. Um, it was a prism validator client to query a non-prism beacon node. And also, it was not possible for a prism validator client to query prism beacon node using a beacon API. These two cases were not possible. Uh, so we had a few steps uh, in order to remediate that. Uh, so the creation of a design document by that. Um, also, because it's kind of a breaking change in the validator client, we need a kind of feature flag uh, to be sure that uh, you use uh, use this big uh, API only uh, when we want. So when, when you launch the validator clients, you have to write a dash dash big API. And, and by default, it, it is still a gRPC. Uh, eventually, I hope it will be by default big API. Uh, then we have to list all the gRPC calls in Prism validator clients to convert more or less easily into Beacon API calls. Sometimes it's easy, so there is one one mapping, and sometimes it's far more complicated. And then after, write all the code to query the Beacon node using Beacon API. It was basically what we did during these four months. Okay. <laughs> um, um, so like when you said, um, the mapping is not always one-to-one. Uh, -one. Actually, most of the time, it isn't. Uh, especially for, uh, for example, the get duties method here, uh, the Bitcoin API has three different uh, endpoints to get duties for the proposer, sync, and uh, the duties. But for the gRPC API, it's only the same one. Um, so we had to do uh, we had to do some like translation between uh, the gRPC uh, structs and the REST API structs. We also had to basically mix and match. Uh, you can see, for example, the proposed Bacon doc uses two uh, Bacon API uh, endpoints internally uh, to be able to emulate the gRPC functionality. Um, so what we decided to do was uh, basically create an interface that uh, takes gRPC structs. And uh, the reason we, we did that is to be able to, uh, to not change the rest of the code uh, as we work on it. Uh, like Manu said, uh, like, of course, we added a feature flag because we don't want to break prison when, when we're working on it. But also, uh, like to minimize the, the risk and the surface area of the code that we change, uh, we didn't want to change any of the, the validator code except for this very thin layer between the Beacon API, uh, between the Beacon node and the, the validator. So as long as you pass uh, the same gRPC structs to uh, this interface, uh, the validator doesn't need to know which implementation it uses on them. You have the gRPC uh, implementation and the REST API implementation that just uh, implements this interface, basically. Um, and which one will be used is just decided by the feature flag uh, that Manu explained before. Um, some, some functions here. Uh, you can see uses streams uh, for gRPC. So those were harder. Basically, had to emulate the gRPC stream because obviously the the REST API doesn't have uh, any stream functionalities. Um, so to do that, we just call uh, the Beacon API uh, every uh, for every like one second interval usually. <laughs> so eventually, those streams API won't be needed when we get rid of the gRPC implementation entirely. But we're not there yet. Um, so at, at the current moment, uh, all these endpoints have been implemented. So it's basically feature complete. Um, um, so, uh, so now we are basically in theory. Uh, we are recompatible with other uh, beacon node implementations. So you can use the Prism Validator client with non prism beacon nodes like TQ and the other uh, consensus uh, teams. And um, now we don't need to go through the, uh, 
uh, well, the, the Bitcoin node still has this conversion, uh, this conversion approach, but the, the theory is that in the future we'll be able to remove all this GRPC legacy code and just have a lot less maintenance uh, burden and a lot less uh, bugs uh, surface. Um, so the next step, uh, is the, even though we're future computers, a lot of uh, testing to do. Uh, obviously, we didn't test this uh, a lot in the test nets yet. Uh, we did it locally, but like very like short-term tests. So we need some more. Uh, uh, first of all, we need some more end-to-end -end tests, uh, and we need to enable end-to-end -end tests before the product was that much. Uh, we didn't want to slow down the present team, so uh, right now the tests are just run after the product was merged, and we don't block uh, the present team at all. Uh, but to uh, prevent regressions in the future, we should enable them before the request uh, gets emerged. Um, we also want to enable this functionality in Hive. So currently Hive has the special code patch just for Prism. Uh, since, since Prism doesn't have, uh, doesn't, well, the developer didn't have any uh, functionality to communicate with other we can, uh, we can load, uh Clients, uh, there's this special code that just for Prism, and we want to remove it and start testing with the REST API. Um, we also have, we also want to have more uh, test passes that mix and match validators and beacon chains. Basically, just to test uh, whether it's fully conformant or if there are still bugs to uh, iron out. And at the end, obviously, we, the only reason we're doing this project is to eventually be able to remove uh, this maintenance burden and remove all those translation layers between the GRPC. And the REST API. Um, so that would be the final goal would be to remove all this legacy code. Um, that's it. Thank you for. Um, I wanted to ask what is the. So what stops you from removing the gRPC? Like, is it the current compatibility like the, uh, for updating the validators or what, why? Just because, like, the, the converter is like so much overhead, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it's not, uh, we didn't test it enough yet. So we want to be able to just uh, have more testing done and okay. we want to yeah. onboard, onboard the, all those test passes mm -hmm. that I talked about so that we're sure that we don't introduce any regressions that were not there before. Yeah. Right? Any bugs. Well, thank you. Um, any other questions? I just want to say on behalf of Prism, thank you. <laughs> it's very useful and it kind of sucks. We were kind of the odd one right there. We couldn't like interrupt, but thank you guys. And now that we're able to have a lot interrupt with other things. Thank awesome. you. <laughs>
and uh, in the long term to say uh, there will be less uh, minor to this blockchain and it's very easy to attack for the attackers. And for, on the other hand, uh, the, if the clients cannot get their transaction included in the blo blockchain, uh, also this blockchain will lose the clients. And uh, so uh, here uh, we should we discovered uh, the deter X uh, attack, which is evicting pending transaction by future transaction. Uh, here we can see there is a big team transaction pool. Uh, we we have the uh, two transaction full filled the transaction pool, and it all sent by the Bob. And then we have a attacker node, and here uh, the attacker sent a transaction which have the higher gas price ninety, and then it will evict the transaction one from that uh, victim transaction pool before. And it will turn transaction two become a future transaction because uh, here uh, the nonce one uh, will disappear and the nonce two transaction will be a future. And here, uh, so, so we already uh, discovered uh, two deter attack variants. One is the deter X, which I uh, just uh, introduced, and uh, the second is Ditcher Z, which is exploit latent overdraft connections. And uh, to sum up, these uh, two attacks also all by sending the high priced but unprofitable transaction to evict some medium price but profitable transaction. So how we can defend those attacks uh, in the memory pool? Uh, we just decline those uh, transactions sending by the uh, attackers. Uh, and to the implementation, we're uh, first to check if the transaction three is future or over latent, uh, or latent overdraft transaction. And then if it evicts some uh, transaction in pending pool, uh, then we will uh, intercept this process of the eviction and uh, decline those uh, incoming transaction. Uh, and for the evaluation part, uh, the first evaluation is about the transaction pool security under uh, our fixed transaction sequences. We just set the initial state of the transaction pool with uh, 4,144 pending uh, transaction, which is uh, now the, uh, the, the full, full state of our uh, gas uh, memory pool. And then we attack the memory pool by sending uh, 200 future transactions to see if the uh, pending transaction will get uh, less and the future transaction will be uh, more. And uh, the, the second attack is to send uh, those future and latent overdraft transaction uh, combined. And we see if there is uh, some over, uh, latent overdraft transaction appeared in the memory pool after the attacks. So uh, the result will, will, we <coughs> we obtain is that uh, there's no attack transaction after we uh, set, the, uh, set the defense. And the second evaluation is the performance evaluation. Uh, we just use the test case in the, uh, uh, on the GitHub uh, on Go Ethereum and uh, it will send some transaction workloads and uh, it will test the time of the uh, workloads and uh, local, uh, the, I think it's the, yeah, there is a time between, different between the old time and the new time. Here's the result. Uh, we can see some of the, time will increase 
but some of the uh, quiet time will uh, decrease a little and uh, it will not increase a lot. So the benchmarking is uh, significant, is not significant worse. So it's, and here is another security evaluation that is uh, an ongoing work. So we just um, put out this open problem. Uh, so is our current defense is security enough or secure enough or uh, are there any unknown crafted uh, se transaction sequences can deny those uh, guest memory pool service uh, and we think the father will uh, solve this problem in the future and we are now trying to use the father to uh, get more uh, concrete work uh, and very grateful for the support of Ethereum Foundation and my mentor, Marius. Uh, he helped me to uh, benchmarking a lot and uh, uh, pull our code on a GitHub already, uh, but it's not merged yet. Uh, and that's all. I think it's a QA time. <laughs> Do you have any questions? Thank you. Well, hello everyone. Thank you for being here. First call. Um, I know we just eat, so try for you to not to fall asleep. Um, yeah. So I'm Ricky. My name is Alex. I'm from Buenos Aires. Um, happy to share with you what I've been working on uh, for the last couple of months. Yes. Yeah, so uh, yeah, my project uh, is uh, the implementation of the consensus layer peer-to-peer -peer network interface for the Helios Light client. So uh, first of all, for those who want to check out, this is the GitHub repo that I've been working on. Um, yeah, I, I won't display any code, but if you can follow, if you want to follow uh, the code, uh, just here's the QR. All right. Uh, yeah, just uh, talking about my first steps on the EPF. Um, so the, we have these project ideas. Um, File, so I just check. Okay, what can I do using Rust? Uh, Alex Stokes uh, submitted some MVV stuff uh, and, and MVV repo for some utils, and then also uh, some uh, consensus layer stuff. So I started. I started checking both of them. Um, did my first update on MVV, but then the Helios like client launched. But so, yeah, what is Helios anyway, right? So Helios is a Rust-based Ethereum like client. Uh, made by the existing C, uh, team, led by uh, No Citron. And so, yeah, I mean, it showed up, uh, just explored the issues and started working on something. Uh, for those that are not familiar with what a light client is, uh, it's basically uh, like basic implementation of a Ethereum node that will allow us to connect in a trustless manner with the Ethereum network uh, in low resource environments, such as a phone, yeah, Piper, I know, that may be a few years away, but uh, maybe a browser. Okay. Sorry. Okay, asking uh, Ferris, what can be improved? So Helios right now is fetching consensus layer data using Alchemy, or in Fiora, you can set that up. Uh, that's uh, not cool, as you may know. So it's basically holding a trust assumption of what the provider is sending to us. Um, yeah, so definitely something that can be approved. So how do we do it? Uh, you just have to implement the Ethereum consensus layer P2P network interface. Uh, yeah, no, not so much, right? Um, and adapt the architecture of the Helios uh, Light Client to work with uh, the maybe like the already working uh, centralized provider fetching data and the new P2P uh, network interface Maybe like maybe synchronize using the uh, provider, but then pass to the uh, peer-to-peer network. By the way, our uh, light clients use uh, consensus layer data to verify uh, the the state. It uses the state routes uh, that uh, is hold, it's held in the consensus layer data blocks 
So we can verify this data on, on the execution uh, side. Yeah, easy stuff. <laughs> yeah, so my initial research was on uh, Ethereum POS architecture. Uh, yeah, spent a couple of weeks doing that. Then uh, the lifetime protocol and the consensus layer peer to peer interface. In the last two of these, uh, I made like a, a short post about yeah, both of these topics. Um, that really helped me to grasp these concepts. Uh, also, like uh, the main driver for, for me writing this stuff is, was like, I had to submit an update for the APF, so why not just make a small post about it, right? Yeah, so that was really helpful for me, and yeah, also like to help uh, more people understand what I'm trying to do. Uh, following that initial research, I started doing a deep dive on the peer to peer stack. So we have uh, the node discovery protocol. Basically, we need a uh, okay, no, wait, I'll go into depth uh, on each of these topics. Uh, we have a discovery v5, uh, we have lib p2p, which has a gossip sub uh, protocol and uh, the request response protocol. Starting with the uh, with disk v5. So we basically need a way to find other peers in the network. Uh, this v5 works uh, using only the UDP um, uh, transport. So it's, it's inspired by Kadim, the idea, uh, distributed hash table, but we're not using that because um, we have a few node records, which are not like multi addresses. Uh, these are flexible records. And so you have to make this uh, adapter to work with libp 2 um, Also, yeah, so this is uh, the first thing I started implementing uh, and working on, on my minimal setup. We then have libp 2 and why are we using libp 2 Well, basically it's clear and in the specs that uh, the TCP transport uh, should be, must be uh, support for every client. Uh, it's a modular networking stack. You can basically use that as a base layer, but then uh, implement your own protocols on top of that. We have Gossip Sub. So Gossip Sub is a general purpose uh, publish subscribe protocol. So I just uh, made this graphic as an example. You can be subscribed to multiple topics and then receive uh, messages on each of these topics that you're subscribed to. You can also like publish uh, to a certain topic. Um, yeah, basically this this will be the way to uh, that uh, message. Uh, yeah, data is uh, gossip between uh, nodes. And then we have the request response protocol or regress protocol. This is uh, mainly used to fetch a specific data from your already connected peers. So you have a, you, you have established a connection, and you maybe you want to just ping the node to see if it's up, or just fetch some specific blocks. Uh, if it's not uh, an archive node, uh, you're you're not gonna be lucky. But maybe it has the blocks that you're asking for. So that was the research part. Now let's get to the hands-on. Um, I made an uh, initial implementation to get this uh, network setup working. This was basically for me to abstract from the Helios code base, um, getting me to like a test environment closer to a, yeah, something where I could iterate fast and find bugs faster. Um, yeah. Make like, make, make like the small examples from the lib to peer um, uh, code examples or the DSP5 code examples too. Yeah, so I already mentioned this, my, between my initial challenges, uh, Discovery V5 needs to be adapted to lib p since the uh, regular stack uses MDNS, which has uh, multi-addresses, uh, addresses. but uh, since we have uh, ENRs, we have to make an adapter between uh, regular like peer IDs and Ethereum uh, node records. I tried to implement like these primitive non-generic data structures. So what uh, this is because like I, uh, a lot of the code I've, I've been doing, I've been looking for it into the uh, Lighthouse client. And so Lighthouse client, Lighthouse client uh, has these generics to deal with every network's network spec. So uh, it, it handles like not only mainnet, but testnet, and also like, uh, I think Gnosis. So 
I try to abstract from everything. So this code setup can be just as simple as possible and handle only uh, main data. And yeah, this is possibly a mistake. Uh, I try a lot to keep code simple. Uh, I think I spent quite some time on that. That's why I'm saying like possible premature optimization. Uh, I think I should have focused more on get things working for doing that. Yeah, a couple more challenges. Yeah, definitely peers are not that cool. So for a bunch of reasons, you will get disconnected. <laughs> um, yeah, at, at the beginning, it was uh, peer scoring. So me not supporting correctly some certain protocols from the request response protocol. Uh, maybe also like just the, uh, if, if you cannot be pinged, uh, you will get shut down instantly. But also this is different on every client. So uh, another challenge was that uh, I had to test with multiple client implementations because right now Lighthouse works, but maybe other clients are not working correctly with, with this setup. The current capabilities of this project are, yeah, I can find uh, peers using discovery Fi through a good note. Uh, I can subscribe and receive the gossip of topics. And uh, I can communicate with uh, peers with the request response protocol. All right, so next steps. So this is something uh, I'm currently working on. I still have to adapt the current code base to meet Helios standard. So there are a bunch of uh, Repos uh, or list, uh, modules from Rust that I've been using that aren't the ones being used in uh, Helios, mostly, I would say, SSC encoding uh, crates, but also uh, I will try to use some uh, Ethereum consensus uh, crates, which has uh, stand more standardized um, types so I can integrate them easily, easily, easier into Helios. Um, I have to implement a peer manager so right now I only like run a initial discovery setup and then connect to every peer. Uh, but once you get disconnected, then there's no another discovery um, step. So definitely a peer manager has to deal, uh, has to do something to uh, keep this amount of stable of peers so you can rely on keep receiving data. And uh, yeah, of course, work on the Helios side to adopt the uh, architecture. All right, so uh, takeaways from all of this work. Luckily for me, internet communications are no longer magic. So this, uh, I'm super happy about this. Like I got to understand how uh, nodes actually communicate with, uh, between themselves, but debugging networking stuff is super hard. Uh, I think I should uh, get some better tooling for this. Um, yeah, I think uh, I will do some research on networking uh, debugging tools. Yeah, special thanks to Alex Stokes, great folk from the EF. Uh, he helped me a lot through this. Noah Citron from ICCNC, he, he basically handed me uh, a lot of stuff uh, from Helios and uh, the Lighthouse team for a great job that they do in, in their clients. Yeah, thank you all for allowing me to explore this garden uh, with you all, so thank you. All right. Um, hi, my name is Kevin, and I want to talk a little bit about the past four months. I worked on consensus client reward APIs, and as the name already says, the motivation behind it was to develop APIs that provide detailed reward data for Ethereum validators. And um, this is the current um, state of the art before we um, implemented the project, and it, it still is. So you have um, on Beacon Chain or Blockchain Explorer different tabs where you can watch the data you're getting. So for proposing blocks, for making attestation, or for participating in a sync committee, and on the right side you can see these attestations are even split down to the source target and head votes. So our goal for our project was to provide the data on rewards paid to the validators and broken down um, for each of their duties, which are, as I already said, making, making annotations, proposing blocks, and participating in the sync committee. Um, the project was, or could be divided, or can be divided into two big milestones. First, deciding the Beacon API endpoints, 
Beacon API endpoints is like a standardized set of APIs for the um, interoperability between beacon implementations or off beacon implementations. And the second big thing or big milestone is to implement those endpoints into one um, consensus client. And we, which means me and another fellow I worked with called NC, decided to go for Lighthouse. Okay, so what are the challenges? Um, there are mainly four challenges. The first thing was to understand basic questions because, um, regarding the rewards. So questions like um, what are attestations, what is a sync committee, and what do the validators get paid for? The <laughs> second big challenge was to have an alignment between the core devs. Um, so everybody is happy with the situation of the Beacon APIs and how they should, should look like. And the uh, third challenge was Rust. So we, we all knew to, so NC and I are new to Rust and we haven't had any prior experience. And the fourth and last challenge was understanding the huge Lighthouse code base. So coming to the conversation between the core develop developers um, of the consensus clients, um, it was really time consuming, but there was also some really great feedback for example, from Saar, we, um, he is working on the Nimbus code base. We received the feedback that he wants to, um, to show for the attestation rewards, the ideal rewards paid, which means if the validator voted correctly for head, target, and source. And correctly means they voted in time and they, they voted right. So how does our APIs look like? So this is the attestation rewards API. You are able to... Um, provide a validator index, you can see it here. And you are also able to provide a public key if you want to, which is here. And you can insert the ins um, desired epoch at the end, and the output looks like the following. So this is the ideal rewards I already mentioned. Um, it is an array containing 33 objects from effective balance zero to effective balance 33. 32, sorry, um, in one ETH increments. And you can make, you can have a look at what's the ideal rewards paid if you have an effective balance of 32 or higher. And you can compare it to the other rewards you're receiving. And you can, can see that the uh, public key got converted to a validator index and also um, the ideal rewards and the actual output of the rewards are the same. So there are no opportunity costs. Um, the second API for block rewards look like the following. Um, you can provide a slot. And for this slot, you get um, the proposal index and the rewards split down to each of their parts. And for the third and last um, endpoint, similar to the attestation endpoint, you provide a validator index or and a pub public key and provide the desired slot at the end. And you get these kind of rewards paid for participating in the sync committee. Okay, what does the future of the project look like? So we implemented it into, into Lighthouse and it should be released in about one month. Um, but I also spotted um, an issue at, at Bristol they also plan to implement it. So I think there's a huge success factor for, for our project. And there is the, this one guy, Patrick, working at Beacon Chain. And mm -hmm. um, he's coming to the Lighthouse Discord and mentioned that they want to implement our API, which is really nice because um, we use Beacon Chain to verify that our rewards or our data is correct. And now they are, the, the tables are turning and they are using our API, which is really nice. So another honorable mention, um, there's this guy called Alex88. Um, he's some random guy in the Lighthouse Discord. And I think this really describes the spirit um, I experienced the past four months. So he just took our open PRs and implemented them into his Lighthouse client locally and tested them and helped us with debugging without any benefit benefits he received for that. He was just interested to, to have these APIs working. And here I'm, um, I'm talking about a bug that I fixed um, for multiple entries for one validator, which really shouldn't be the case. 
Yeah, some closing words. Thanks to my mentor, Michael, from Lighthouse. Um, thanks to NC for insightful discussions. And thanks to Josh and Mario for running the EPF. Yeah, yeah. that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Bob and Andrew. Um, I think, um, and to start this slide last minute, because um, I actually thought last week I had one three slides. Um, so the project I'm working, I've been working on is EFI Boy Four Four, consensus client. Um, but you're going to realize like uh, most of the slides are not related to this um, because um, <laughs> because of um, some challenges on, on the spec update. Uh, there's been changes to, to the spec, and, and, and as a result, I have to also change my implementation as well. Um, and it's a bit of wait time on the spec, so I kind of jump between different tasks. So I'm going to just talk through a lot of them. And so I don't really have a standalone project like, like most people do, um, it's just a bunch of smaller tasks. Um, hopefully, I can explain it a little. Um, we have enough time. Yeah, so I mentioned that. So just a bunch of smaller tasks, uh, mainly focusing on the 444, which is um, prototype charting and uh, the Lighthouse Consensus Client. And yeah, the goal is to contribute to implementation and testing. Um, that's the initial um, goal, and also learning lots of quite a big challenge as well for, for me. So yes, just a bunch of um, links here. I'm gonna show some diagrams if, if, if they're useful. Um, so that's, that, that's kind of like the main task that I was working on. Um, um, Upping through the API uh, for 444, um, which um, so Gabby and I initially picked this one because we thought it's um, something that we haven't started uh, doing spec on. So there's an opportunity for us to start from the very, very beginning, um, looking at the spec, um, um, drafting the spec, and getting feedback just to understand the end to end core dev um, process. So that was cool. And initially, we thought um, this might be like a smaller task because based on this discussion between like Terrence and a few other guys, um, it's going to be like one little change to the API. So we thought, oh, this might be too small, so we need to add a few more tasks to our project. <laughs> and it turned out we're completely wrong. Um, this is still a work in progress. Um, it's, uh, I don't know if it's like 50% done or, or less. Um, because um, there's some recent changes to the consensus spec that required me to do a lot of update to it. Um, I'm going to show quickly show the design, um, but it's mostly going to be wrong um, um, because there's a recent change. I'm not sure. If, um, I think for people that are following 444, uh, it's uh, quite a big change on um, decoupling the block from the block on gossip. So um, they kind of change a lot of things on how we uh, like how we can do the uh, the builder flow because now we're also required to sign the blobs. Um, so that's quite a, a bit of change, and I, I still haven't figured out what exactly how we can do this. So this is definitely working for us. Um, yeah, quickly show a diagram. Um, Um, yeah, I was slightly tempted to steal Daniel's diagram because that's a lot better. Um, <laughs> um, this is slightly different. Um, so this is me trying to understand um, what the end-to-end -end flow looks like on um, the builder side for Yabby 4844. Um, I don't know if it's too small. So yeah, so this is um, an attempt to try to understand the end to end flow of where the blob is coming from and going to. Um, and this is like now like quite outdated now. So I'm just going to spend a bit of time just to get through it because I've actually done a draft implementation in Lighthouse as well, which is not going to be changed. Um, but um, this bit is like the, the proposer's um, Ethereum node. So there's a bigger node, there's a local EL, and there's MapBoost. And there's a validated client as well. Um, and, and that's kind of from the user side uh, where the user sends a block transaction, it goes to the execution node, and then it gets um, broadcast or actually announced to the other execution 
nodes in the network. Um, and that's how they, they get the blob into the, the, the mempool, um, which I have still, still like a magic to me. I don't know what the, um, the, the blob mempool is going to look like um, still. Um, so um, once they get the blob onto the mempool, and then there's also searchers and block builders that will try to shoot transaction, look at transactions and, and blobs in the mempool, and then submit the block and the blob to the relays. Um, and the propo from proposal side, uh, there's uh, uh, will, the flow will start from the validator where they will try to get bind the block. Um, and then this, this bit is kind of similar to what Daniel just explained. Basically, the beacon will, ha will have to go to MVP boost to get a, um, get a header back. Uh, but the difference here is that we also now need to get the block, block component back so that the validators can sign. And there's been discussions on whether we want to get the full blob, full blob, full blob, or a binary blob blob. Um, so uh, right now, this is based on having it like a blinded um, blob um, flow. So what happens is the validator will start in retrieving the block, and then the relay will return the blinded block, which is the header, and then plus a blinded blob back to the bad hitter client to sign. And then uh, the client will then be able to sign the header and sign the, um, the blinded blob as well, and then something back to the relay. Um, and then the relay would then um, broadcast the block and blobs, and then also we return the review payload and blobs back to the beacon node, which the beacon node would then broadcast again. Um, so this is not final, uh, but just probably good to show like the kind of work that I've been working on. Um, yeah, so next one. So yeah, there's been quite a few um, tasks um, related to this. Um, I've, I've just put in a, bit of, a bunch of links. Probably not that super useful, but um, um, there's uh, spent quite a bit of time with Gabby on um, the spec updates. So initially we started with spec because we thought it would be good to have the specs out early to start some discussions. So we drafted the spec and then we realized, oh, we also need to update the Capella stuff as well. Um, so it's kind of like a dependency. So we extend our scope to also update Capella um, spec as well. Um, and that uh, PR has been merged. And then now we also have the Deneb um, PR separated now because um, e 44 has been pushed back to the next fork. Um, so that's the old um, working process and progress. And, um, I, also, I have a draft implementation, which is mostly updated now. Um, I'm not going to go through it too much. Um, so yeah, so that's the time that I spent on the computer API update. So actually, I ended up spending a lot of time on the stuff, so I'm going to go through that. Yeah, um, and that's this is kind of like an updated version of the previous one, except that um, it's become more complicated um, and potentially outdated now as well. So um, I need to another version, so I'm going to go through again. But the main thing is that um, we experimented um, separating the, um, the public of block and blobs from the beacon node side, which turned out to be a bit of a problem um, and becomes a bit more complicated because we needed a way to for the beacon node to, to, to um, review for unbind the blobs. So um, that means the validator client will have to always talk to the same beacon node, which is not always the case if you use something like Vouch or if you have like um, a century nodes where you have like multiple beacon nodes um, that as a, as a fallback, and then there'll, there'll, there'll be problems with um, like unblinding the blobs. So this could be slightly more complicated. Um, we haven't found a solution yet. Um, I think right now, I think it might be easier to we just combine block and block in, in the uh, in the summary of the flow. But yeah, this is also not done. And then the other component in my project is the te um, the testing bit of yeah before it for four. Um, initially, um, I at the beginning of the project, I um, I looked at the yeah before it for four interop repo um, created by Murphy um, Optimism, I think, um, and. Um, I think our house was missing in that repo, and then I thought it'd be cool to have it because um, that repo contains um, um, 
the Docker comp compose file for um, with other other clients like get client as well, so you can test the interop um, and also test a few main um, features of yeah, for, for, for. Um, I think I think most of the repos are there. There are some some tests um, that are like, related to for 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 the repo, so I thought it'd be cool to, to add that. So we spend a bit of time uh, with Murphy on getting that pull request merge, um, and then also I created doc compose to uh, for Lighthouse. Um, to, to join the 4844 v3, um, which is probably not that useful now because we've got v4, v5. Um, and then um, I also did a um, did some work on the download block API in Lighthouse, um, just kind of just to help with testing because before we had that had that API, we were mainly using the request response interface to create the blocks, and that turned out to be a bit of, a bit of challenge, um, kind of similar to what Ricky explained about um, peers are not that cool. Um, so you have to implement like a full. Uh, you have to implement all the um, the, um, the topics in the gossip. So that was slightly painful, but um, I think we've got that as well. But now, we can uh, kind of make it a bit easier to test because you can just like create for for a blog and then get get it back. Um, I can quickly show the response from that API, but now that's that's all going to be changed as well. Um, let me show this. Next slide. So basically, um, this endpoint allows you to like provide a block ID or like a slot number, and then get back the the blobs. This is like <coughs> an output with a slot with no blobs. Um, so like the blob array is empty, and then you also got that empty aggregate group proof which doesn't exist anymore in the spec. Um, so this is this needs to be updated, um, and there's also output example output with blob as well. So um, that's also on my list update. And then that's the, so that's the testing. And then the next bit I looked at was um, understanding Lighthouse and did a bit of work on Lighthouse, which is which are like less related to 4844. Um, I've got some notes here on like my initial attempt to understand try to understand Lighthouse. Uh, it's bigger than what a slide can be, so let's do that separately. Is this one? Um, Sorry. Okay. Yeah, I'm not going to go into too much detail, but um, um, uh, this is kind of like the, the, like what happens when you start the new Lighthouse node. Um, you have a, like a main, like main component where it creates a beacon node um, object, and then it's got a bunch of stuff in it. It's got, a, it's got an API server, metric server, and then a networking service where mm. you will get like messages from, from, from your peers and you have to get them pass it on um, to other components to process. And in this diagram, I was focused on understanding the beacon mm. um, processor, which um, mainly look after like um, blocks that, come, that comes in. Um, and then, um, so what happens when you get a message is that it, um, the networking working service pass on the message to a router, which then pass on to pass on the message to a beacon processor that 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 spawns um, like work threads in parallel and process the um, the uh, the tasks. So um, this initial exploration turned out to be helpful because um, it helped me in doing the next thing that I was I'm going to mention. Oops, um, which is the uh, another issue on Lighthouse that um, uh, about backfill sync. So um, backfill sync is is, um, is a mechanism that that happens when you use checkpoint sync um, to another beacon node. Um, you you download the, the latest finalized state, and then um, and then there's forward sync that happens so that you can sync to the latest spot. But then there's also a backfill sync, which allows, which 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 will allow it to sync all the way back to Genesis. Um, I think there's also an open PR in Lighthouse to to just limit that to like the weeks subjectively, week subjectively uh, point, which is like five months. So that will decrease the storage requirement for CLs. Um, but this one's slightly different. This is about um, red limiting the, the backfill processing, um, and the reason for that is because there are some. Um, 
some some people of the community that that's, that's raised an issue about the CPU consumption when they initially sync. Um, it looks like the CPU just get hammered from like, all the back end processing because it doesn't get very limited. So just keep processing it uh, until it goes back to the genesis. So sometimes it requires a lot of CPU power to do that. Um, and the point of doing this is to to slow down the red limiting, which is probably not super important for most people. If you're running about data, you don't need like all the histor historical data. Uh, it might be useful for people like that runs archive node. They would want historical data um, quickly. So um, I actually added a feature to also um, allow you to toggle that on and off. So if you, if you run an archive node, then you don't want to read it. You want just want to do it as far as, as, as you want. You can still do that. But for most people, um, we're going to um, read limit by default. So unless you want to override that. Um, I'll quickly show a uh, design that is slightly to the level. I'm, I'm not sure if it's going to be useful for everyone, but um, this is the existing um, how it works within Lighthouse. Um, so probably not worth going to, to, to too much low level. But um, I, I mentioned before that there's a networking stack that pass on the message to a beacon processor. Um, and when backfill happens, um, we get the um, the backfill batch um, in the blocks from a um, event channel, and that goes to the beacon processor, and then it then processes it immediately or, or it kills it. Um, so this is what happens currently. Um, it just keeps looping through and then see if there's any work coming in, and which doesn't get really limited. So it's constantly in the loop. And, and um, the solution that was proposed by Lighthouse team was to add a red limiter in between. So rather than process, processing this immediately, um, we have an intermediate queue, uh, which is probably going to get too small. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but um, I'll share the slides as well. But basically what happens is now there's an intermediate um, red limited queue. So whenever we receive this, it's going to send to that queue. And we don't process it straight away. Uh, we process it at a later timing schedule. Um, right now we've um, did, did a bit of performance bench, bench, benchmarking just to see the CPU impact. Um, right now we're doing like three times within a slot. So we, we, we process, process it three times. Um, so every batch is like two epochs of 60, 64 blocks. So we process three batches in a slot. So not like previously where we just do as fast as we can. Usually go to like four or five batches per slot. But now we've just like slowed down to three. So it happens at six, seven, and I think nine or ten seconds after the slot start starts. So it doesn't impact the violator as much because it doesn't happen in the critical window, which is like the first few seconds of the slot. So this is now like a scheduled processing instead of like like not really limited. Really um, so that's one thing, and then. The most recent piece of work that I've been working on is the, the blob signing bit. Um, so that's also like some new work that came out from the freezer blobs, um, the uh, decoupling of blocking blobs. So now uh, we have to sign the blobs that gets um, propagated to, to other nodes. So I've been working on this now, and um, this is still uh, um, uh, not finalized yet because um, there's been discussions on um, on the blob signing as well, whether um, this happens um, as a single client request or whether it happens separately to the block. So there's an open PR on the specs, uh, in the consensus spec. So I have a PR here, but um, still also needs to be updated depending on what the outcome is, which is like happened to most of the work that I've been, um, I've been doing. Um, so lots of iterations, but um, I don't think it's wasteful. It's just, um, Good learning. Um, like, like I mentioned, yeah, like a lot of the work are working, still work in progress. Um, there's lots of spec change along the way, um, and sometimes change can take a while because um, also don't want to get the spec merged too quickly and then modify later. It's good to have some input from other client teams, and also the people that also been doing experimentation. They might have some takeaways from it and then contribute to the spec. So it's generally not a bad thing, and it's good to have like. The draft specs out there, at least to start some discussions. And I've also ex uh, ex explored that it's quite uh, useful to also implement a POC before the spec is finalized. Uh, because I just, I, I can find, sometimes I found it useful to discover potential issues, uh, which happened to most of my PRs anyway. Um, um, I'm so happy that someone can emerge, someone must still draft or post, sadly. Um, 
Yeah, that's all. Um, special thanks to EF and Josh Mario on the house team, Sean, Diva, and Paul. It'd be very helpful and everyone that, that's helped me as well. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. <laughs> Yeah. So hi everybody. Uh, I'm Bip. Uh, we met already. Uh, so I will present. So part of the fellowship, I was working on the bundler implementation for the uh, new account obstruction proposal in Rust. Uh, so the motivation was uh, this quote from Vitalik. Uh, he said, "Account obstruction has for a long time been a dream of the Ethereum developer community." Uh, so there are two things to this. So one is that a content abstraction has been a dream, so it is something that is very good, uh, is very beneficial, and it also means it also it also says that it has been for a long time. Uh, so there were there were many attempts to do a content abstraction. There were three improvement proposals. Uh, so it's been so I think that first improvement proposal is like many years old already, uh, but there was like problems with first two proposals is that. They wanted to make some changes to the EVM to add some new opcodes and things like that, which is like was a problem because it was never the best time to do like these big changes to the EVM because there were like other priorities like the EIP one five five nine or like the merge and now there is like proto dunk sharding. So the last proposal that was introduced four three three seven is trying to do a cons abstraction in a little bit different way. Uh, so basically the idea here is that avoids consensus layer protocol changes and instead relies on a higher level infrastructure. So basically the consensus and execution clients don't have to make like don't have to make a single change. You just introduce the new entities that work with the execution clients and Basically, you can run account abstraction without, without making changes to the core clients. Um, so basically, you have you introduce uh, several entities in this model. So one are the bundlers, which I was working on. Then you have like this entry point smart contract. Uh, this is like the singleton uh, smart contract. So there is only like one uh, on the blockchain. And basically, all user operations, like Garbit already mentioned today, uh, uh, goes through through this smart contract. Uh, so basically, bundlers su submit the user operations through this smart contract, and then this smart contract verifies the signature, and also calls the paymaster. So paymaster is the entity that can sponsor the gas for the user operations, and basically execute these user operations, which contain basically uh, the smart contract calls. Uh, for that user operation. And user operation is basically very similar to the transaction. It can also contain other like signature schemes. Uh, so back to bundler. A bundler is some kind of node equivalent component for the account obstruction. So it can be run by anybody. Um, it has like several jobs. It receives user operations for smart contract wallets. It then validates these user operations. It bundles user operations into bundle, which is like a normal transaction that is in the end submitted by the bundler to the execution client. Um, and it also has like this peer-to-peer -peer protocol to exchange user operations with other bundlers. Um, so the goal uh, for this fellowship was to like implement the bundler in Rust. Uh, like to do a full implementation from the ground up uh, and to pass the bundler spec tests that were that were released by the Ethereum Infinities and this uh, team in the December, and then to try this bundler with one of the smart contract wallets. Uh, so basically, these these goals were set in October. Um, so now we are in February. Uh, we are in March already, and some goals were achieved, uh, but not all. So basically. Uh, I will go, we'll go back to that. So uh, this is the architecture for the bundler. So I wanted to like split some responsibilities into different components. This is like similar to the, what is Aragon is doing with their execution client. So basically, you have I have like three main components, which is like the JSON RPC API. Then we have like user operation pool, which is similar to the transaction pool, 
and we have like this bundler core logic that is actually bundling user operations. And so we have like outside of the bundler, we have like Ethereum execution client and also Ethereum execution client. But the difference is that here is like the peer to peer protocol to exchange user operations with different bundlers. And here we have like when the bundler submits the bundles to the execution client. Um, so this architecture was interesting for me because let's say that you have like specific logic in how you want to bundle the user operations into bundles. So you can do, you can just sort the user operations and bundle like the ones that pay you the most, or you can like support one paymaster, or you can like have different logics. And with this architecture, the idea was to like, if you like run components separately, you can just spin on all the bundler instance with the same user operation pool and with this new bundler instance, instance, you can just have different logic on how to bundle the user operations into the bundle. Uh, there is also one thing that when the bundlers submit the bundle to the execution client, they have to communicate with the both producers or use flashbots, uh, protect to prevent front running because like when bundlers let's say they find some smart logic, uh, how to combine the user operations bundle. And when they submit the bundle to the execution client, if they submit it to the public transaction pool, other bundlers could see uh, what did they do and just steal basically the bundle and pay more fee to, and basically front run the other bundler. So there are like some solutions to that. Um, yeah, so here are like the details, what had to be developed uh, basically Sanity checks, simulation, mempool, reputation, peer to peer protocol, and, and communication with execution client node, execution layer nodes. Maybe I didn't select the best color for that, but the, this thing is darker. This thing is darker, and this thing is darker. So basically, the dark things are already implemented, the not so dark, dark things are not. Um, so, sanity checks, these are base, these are like simple uh, checks. Uh, when the bonders submit user operations so basically they just check if all the fields are set correctly every bundle also has to simulate user operation this is basically calling the handle ops uh, function of the entry point entry point smart contract and then the debug api for the get is used to basically get like information which opcodes are used uh, for this user operation because some opcodes are like forbidden uh, because there is a time when bonders receive the user operation and then there is a time when they submit actually user operation to the as a transaction to the node and between this time like some things can change like the block numbers and things like that and basically if the user operation contains this block number after some times this user operation could be invalid but at the at the submission time from the smart contract wallet it could be valid so basically some of codes are forbidden and there is also like a reputation model. This is basically each bundler keeps a reputation for paymaster factories because it's like some paymasters wants to cheat, it will get bad, banned by the uh, bundler after some time. If like it wants to submit the invalid user operations, and this is basically to prevent denial of service attacks. Um, so basically, the mempool is already implemented. There are like two implementations. One is just simple in memory. So, and the other one is with database. So it's per, it is persistent if the bundler shuts down. Um, and also support for multiple mempools is already implemented because like I said, there is a singleton uh, entry point smart contract, but it can turn out that after some time it will, it will be like one buck in the entry point. So the entry point can be um, upgraded. And there is like this time when the entry, entry point is upgraded, uh, basically, both entry points will be used for some time before, like all smart contract wallets, uh, go to the new, uh, use the new entry point. So the bundler should support multiple mempools. And there, are, and also the idea is that everyone can define his their own mempool, which has like different rules, which user operations are allowed. Um, but at the moment, there is like only canonical mempool. And so peer-to-peer -peer protocol was defined. I think it was three weeks ago. Um, the idea was to use lead peer to peer and SSZ um, because the idea was, I mean, the lead peer to peer is like, I think that the execution 
client, the peer-to-peer -peer is meant to also replace that peer-to-peer -peer, like in the future. So the, the idea was to use like for the bond, there's three peer-to-peer. So after some times, the peer-to-peer -peer protocol won't have to change. Um, and yeah, that's it. Uh, so here are the spec tests. <laughs> that are like a lot of fails <laughs> um like some some uh, tests are passing like these forbidden opcodes uh also some tests are passing but the the basically it took a long uh, long time to set everything up um but now it will be much easier to continue because like for some tests there is like you have to just implement one function and check like one rule for the user operation and it's like it can be like 15 lines of code to just pass some additional tests, but for this, just to run this test, you had to like set, uh, set up like Docker files. You have to run the get node in development mode. You have to uh, like deploy entry point contract on each uh, run and things like that. So it took quite a lo long time. Um, so in the future, the plan is to finish this implementation and pass the remaining tests. Uh, there was also the idea to develop some client library in Rust for the user operations um, or extend Ether's Rust library for that um, because the Ether's Rust library is very good, but if you want to do some specific things or maybe things that are more new and not so much used by many projects, it turns out that uh, this library probably won't support that functionality, so you have to do it yourself. And basically, the, the idea is also to use ref in some way. So one way would be to add a bundler component to the ref, or because ref is developed like in, like in a very modular way with many uh, crates, uh, it is also possible to reuse like one of the crates uh, of the ref, maybe for the dev peer-to-peer -peer protocol, because uh, basically the bundlers need to listen to the execution layer node to see which user operations were already included in the blocks so they can remove these user operations from the mempool. Uh, so there was like kind of idea to show the demo, um, but now that I'm on the Mario computer, this won't happen. Um, but if someone is interested, it can, it, we can talk later. Um, yeah, so some links. Uh, so I was working on the bundler with Will. He was also the a fellow that was working with that he's actually very good in rust so it was interesting to work with him so the mentors were hoaf and Dror. i don't know why i didn't put his name there uh, Dror Tirosh. uh and here are like some links uh, to check uh, so this is like the bonded implementation and like anyone wants to ask some questions after the eighth number and that's it thanks Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so my name is Andre. Uh, from for my uh, project, I did a kind of self-sustained uh, work uh, on something called the Helium Monster, expanding this thing called the Helium Monster. Uh, so first, like a little bit about me. I, don't, I think I did an intro, but there's a bunch of new faces. So, so I'm Andre. I graduated a few years ago. I spent a, little, a year and a half working um, at this database company on the distributed database on the kernel team. Um, and over the last year, I've been doing uh, application level research at this place called Xerox Park, which is, um, has some, some interesting experiments there. I'm happy to chat with some of them after. Um, so uh, a little bit of background of why I'm interested, uh, so, so how, how this came about. So I got interested in core development and uh, heard about EBF long the merge, because it's just an amazing technical achievement. Um, and then after the merge, I got interested in MEV. So um, one thing that was kind of, yeah, caught my attention was the adoption of uh, MevBoost, um, like, and these things relays popping up and uh, had pretty significant, yeah, very significant adoption and a lot of uh, uh, just blocks being delivered through essentially like uh, one relay and one like repository, like uh, one single source code. Um, and so, yeah, I got interested in this interaction between MEV and the protocol. Um, then I got interested in short-term uh, mitigations because we all kind of know now that there's in protocol PBS, ideally soon, but uh, like what can be done in the short term? I pick my interest, and I stumbled upon the relay monitor repo by by Alex Stokes, um, and kind of uh, this was also on, on on one of the suggested projects. But um, so I started looking at that. 
So, um, and yeah, I expanded the relay monitor. But first, like, um, why relay monitor? So, uh, I'm going to try to keep this very brief, and we kind of talked about, I think there was a mention of enough boost relays before. But, like, this is kind of the reality right now that there's like barely double digits of relays, right? And a pretty high percentage of blocks being delivered through uh, a relay. So, um, MevBoost really is an auto protocol PPS implementation where, um, yeah, blocks are constructed not by the validators. They're constructed uh, by builders and then forwarded uh, through this relay that is required for multiple reasons, but the fundamental reason is that builders and validators don't trust each other. Um, and uh, yeah, like at a high level, like validators opt in, so they, it's, it's the opt in, they don't have to run MevBoost, but they, a lot of uh, validators do. Um, and the relay kind of signs up, the MevBoost relay uh, signs up to, like signs up, what it promises to do is it delivers uh, headers to um, uh, validators, to proposers, when it's their time to propose, and it kind of signs up to deliver payload. So it promises, hey, like if you sign over this, I'm gonna give you the payload. So then you have a block and then you like got propose it to the network. Um, and a proposer, in turn, like they also sign up to do certain things. They 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 enter in this kind of contract where they say, well, um, yeah, give me like when when it's time to propose a block, um, a validator says, okay, what kind of header do you have for me, and like how much value can you give to me? How much MEV did some block builder extract? And then they kind of wait for the payload and hope it happens. I uh, hope hope it hope it comes. Um, there's some things here that uh, I already mentioned, like dominance of MevBoost. Another thing is that MevBoost is just like another, like it's a go, it's a go binary. So um, there's there were already issues where, like, because of improper validation uh, by the relay, uh, people could submit blocks that had invalid uh, builders submitted blocks with invalid timestamps, and they got uh, forwarded by the relay to the uh, proposers asking for a bid, uh, but then proposers check themselves were like, well, this time step is incorrect. And they had to fall back on uh, local building or like, yeah. Uh, so, so not that bad, but still like you just see that uh, the relay is in the middle. If it fails to do something, it, there's direct consequences to the proposers who like opt in to communicate via this relay. Um, so yeah, basically the, the re relays are in like a privileged position. So what a relay monitor does um, kind of fundamentally is it connects to relays. So you specify like in the config, like which relay, which relay you want to uh, monitor, and it checks the headers. So I'll mention how it does it. It can check the payloads that are delivered by the relay, and it computes scores for its relay based on some criteria. So the scores, I just, I kind of came up with them, but like, uh, yeah, you can, you can do multiple things there. Um, and uh, after doing all that, it exposes an API for records and stats. So like if somebody, the point is that to kind of surface this information out for anyone who cares. Uh, for instance, a validator who wants to get some info into what the relay is doing. Um, and yeah, this this little point is um, not that important. It's basically like it, it, it's another way to kind of allow validator input into the behavior of a relay. So so a validator can essentially make a uh, like a post request and say, look. Um, here's a block that I received from this relay. I signed over it. Here's a payload. Like something went wrong, and you can kind of, um, yeah, you can you, you, you can kind of prove that something, yeah, weird is going on in the relay. Um, th this just a simplified diagram again. Like um, what what out of protocol uh, PPS does, and what this MevBoost relay does is that like, like it separates um, this like proposer and block payloads, right? Um, there's different APIs here. And so what the relay monitor does is over this thing over here, right? It talks to the relay API, to the proposer API, and like there's an opt-in way for proposers to submit some data. So it's like it's 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 like it's a watchtower, right? Like uh, on the side a little bit. Um yeah, um I mentioned this already, but um one of the th like there there are two pieces of like out of protocol PBS. First is like headers and then block bodies because uh, you can't just have a builder submit the entire block body because otherwise the MEV can get stolen uh, so by, by the proposer. So um, for the demo purposes, I'm going to show like header validation. So a relay monitor can validate like headers that it receives through uh, from the um, from the uh, relay. Uh, basically, it's like header and bid. Uh, I use them interchangeably. Um, so yeah, what, what I did, I mentioned, started with Alex's repo as the foundation. 
I added a bunch of stuff. This is just a subset, but uh, bit storage and analysis. So like every bit that uh, it just stores everything that it can find from every relay. It also stores the analysis, which uh, it, it performs validation of the headers, which I'm going to show. Um, it allows for time-based queries. You can ask for like, give me like all bits that this, uh, how many bits did the Pacific relay deliver between these slots? You can actually get fault, like records of faults. Um, there's scoring that I implemented like for reputation and bit delivery rate. Uh, just pretty, pretty simple, uh, like proof of concepts. Um, and uh, there's also like these operational metrics that are exposed. Um, basically, like how, what, what's uh, the monitor doing? Um, yeah, I wrote up a spec. Um, it's kind of still a work in progress. And then I created this like builder bit fault fuzzer because I wanted to simulate uh, meth boost relays that are faulty. Because super surprise, like even the one in Sepolia, the one that Flash was runs, it's like it works, but it doesn't really uh, fail that much. So I wanted to simulate a bunch. Uh, so I just like wrote up this thing that can simulate fault. Um, uh, yeah, so I have a few quick demos. Um, I recorded them just for the sake of like simplicity, so I don't keep so so I don't keep like switching back and forth. But uh, yeah, uh, uh, let's see. I don't know. Is, is this big enough? Yeah, cool. Um, so uh, yeah, first uh, like pretty simple. Uh, is this pause? Yeah. Um, you can see like endpoint monitor fault stat. Also, I'll mention that like I put up this back on like API that really monitor that plays XYZ. I just like type this up so you can check it out if you want. Like the demo just shows uh, like requests that, you know, in, in Postman, but it just implements the spec. Um, I just like wrote up a bunch of stuff here. Uh, yeah, so um, monitor v1 fault, like stats endpoint, you send the request and you get back data that looks like this. So it's like a report uh, for uh, all the relays that are monitored. There's like a that gets indexed by public key. So um, this is like, you know, some sort of relay identified like that. You can see host name. This is the uh, Flashbus builder on Sepolia. Um, and, you know, over the last, like, whatever slot, you can specify by slot bounds. It delivered like 914 bits, whatever. Um, so pretty simple so far. Um, sends the request. Um, you can do individual relays. So nothing, to, you can specify a public key in the route and you get stats just for a single relay. Uh, so pretty simple here. Um, yeah, like for instance, zero faults for this polyon. Um, the other uh, route is like the actual records. So you can like request a, a record report. First, it was the stats report. This is a record report. So like um, it actually gives back a list of consensus and valid bits. So if like a relay misbehaves and the and the relay monitor detects like look, there's there's a bit that violates. Um, you know, yeah, it's, it's invalid with respect to consensus. In this case, you can see like the parent hash is just like zero, it's invalid. So it like recorded a bunch of these bits, dumped them into the, uh, like a database and you can like query for a time series essentially. But it gives you some info like, like the proposer pop key here, like slot and what exactly was wrong with it. And, and it's grouped under, like the thing that I didn't mention, it's grouped under consensus invalid bits. So there's different faults and the relay monitor can like track all of them. Um, yeah, so there's like a list of all these faults that it just tracks. Um, let's see what else is here. It's recorded. Yeah, same thing, like per relay record. Um, other metrics I just, I'm just showing, validator count. So these are like relay operation metrics. It's like how many like bids uh, did the uh, relay monitor analyze, how many of them were valid. So pretty simple endpoints, so just like an API. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so this is, Kind of stuff, but explanatory. Um, the next thing that I wanted to show is like some of the scoring. So here, um, there's an endpoint uh, slash score slash reputation, and um, this um, uh, what's happening here is basically like it, it, the relay monitor uses the, the information that's dumped that, that it has like all the records of all the faults, and it computes um, yeah like like a trustworthiness score. So uh, right now this, the score is pretty simple. It's just some like exponential, like based on recency, like if the fault is very recent, the score just plummets. Um, and if the, uh, you know, the more time passes and if the relay doesn't uh, misbehave, the score increases. So um, in this little demo, like I show, so I send a request, like this score is a hundred. This is like score 32 uh, for this like fake relay that I'm running. Now it's jumped to 39. So every slot, there's no fault. So the score keeps increasing a uh, little bit by little bit. Um, let's see what, uh, yeah, okay, now it went up to 45, so you get it, like, uh, really doesn't misbehave, um, uh, score increases. 
So uh, what I'm doing next is I'm spinning up like a, a, a faulty relay. I'm just showing, like using this like fuzzer little tool that I made. Um, and now I'm enabling some sort of fault. So I'm injecting fake faults. In this case, there's going to be some sort of like this. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm using a, the wrong public key. So the, the bits that this fake like local relay that I'm running, uh, the bits that it's going to be delivering are going to have some mistakes in it. So they're going to be signed, but the, the, the public key is going to be wrong. So the relay monitor is supposed to detect it. And so the score is 45, and now the score jumped down to zero. So it like penalized it. It detected the bit. It figured out that it's very recent, and it like dumped it all the way to zero. Um, yeah, because it's using a bad public key. Uh, similar, and, and, and so um, what happened there is, so the score went back to, back down to zero because it's like a, a critical fault, right? But then um, you, you can kind of imagine that maybe it's like a, a bug in Flashpass Relay or whatever. So it's, it got penalized. I shut down the relay. So imagine like people just like disconnect from it or like uh, the bug has been fixed. And so um, now if there's no fault, the score is going to keep going go back up. So like, pretty simple. Um, and yeah, I think um, the other demo I had was just like, uh, there's another bit delivery score. I'm not going to show it just because it's it basically just computes the ratio of in the last n slots, how many bits were delivered. Um, so like, for instance, uh, you, you can maybe imagine a validator might use this to say, well, this relay just stopped delivering bits. Like what, like what happened? I actually saw this, like it was funny on Tuesday um, since OEA got upgraded, the flashbots, uh, um, really just stop producing bits. Mm. And like it, it just like for, for a few hours, it just stopped. And so like, you know, this ratio of the, the delivery score, which is probably, <coughs> since like the relay is not delivering bits. Um, yeah. Uh, okay. So yeah, there's a few links that I wanted to, it's just like some work in progress. Um, repos, like the little father, my implementation, like my fork of Alex's repo, that's uh, yeah, it's work in progress. It's gonna, I hope it's gonna be merged back into the original repo, so it's all in the same. Like soon, TM uh, uh, back into uh, like yeah, just I aggregate mine and Alex's repos. Uh, I just forked it in order to commit like work in progress code without waiting for code reviews. Um, and uh, lastly, I wanted to to like, finish with the slow meme, but like uh, I think MV is very interesting. It's clearly like a pretty big problem or like, challenge, and it's it's very difficult to design like things that quote unquote solve uh, MEV. So this is not really about that. It's more like illumination of activity and like kind of seeing like what's going on, um, and potentially this like watchtower just can act as a source of a source of information for validators to see like what what's going on with them. What's going on with the specific relay? So yeah, it's not much, but it's on the floor. Uh, yeah, it's like, yeah, finally, thank you, uh, Josh Mario, for, for the opportunity to be here. And uh, thanks for Alex for starting the original repo. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Do you, do you think that this should make the like HP configure to be able to make decisions about what the relay yeah. is saying? Or do you think it should be a dashboard where users kind of? Watch it I think it should be both, but but I imagine that it's probably useful to have like a kill switch kind of thing. Like I remember coming across some some designs that suggested that if something goes terribly wrong, the consensus client or something just just shut off, you know, access to, uh, yeah, just shut off and mev boost. Um, obviously, there's like challenges, right? Because people can grief and cause a lot of outliers to like, disconnect from the blues. But um, I think it should be both. I, I do think that, like, for, for things like the bit delivery score, I think it's less important because it's like, you know, maybe like a validator who wants to maximize their like profits wants to, you know, automatically switch to the relay that delivers the most bits. Maybe they can, like, for, you know, fork MevBoost themselves or maybe do it manually. But for something like faults, uh, I would say that. I can see it being useful to be in MapBoost. So MapBoost can like disconnect as soon as possible from a relay that's faulty until the score goes back up based on, you know, no faults and like M faults and last N slots, whatever. Yeah. Uh, is the project on it? Um, uh, no, it's, um, so I have a thing running on Sepolia, like uh, monitoring like the, the building there and the stuff that I showed. So, as I mentioned, there's, there's just not a lot of interesting activity because like that build, it doesn't get that much that activity and it doesn't fail so much. That's why I came up with this like fuzzer to just make artificially failing relays. Uh, but no, I, yeah, I, I've been I've been monitoring the, the one on um, Sepolia, the flashbots really. Nice I actually think like 
find it's a LIGO and Logi group will be very interested in this because they kind of force no, no, no operator to use mm. relay, but no operator doesn't know like, what a few relays to use. So, yeah. this, so I think this will be very interesting. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think so. Um, I think just some some things like testing remains, and then ideally, like it's merged with Alex's repo. We just figure out how to combine this and like, yeah, make make a release and uh, put this on the for sure. Awesome. Thanks. Um, anything else? Thank you so much, Andre. Yeah, thank you so much. Andrew. talk about some of my work that I've done over the fellowship these four months. Um, I had my hands in a few different cookie jars here, but what I started off with was EOF v1, and um, I was learning quite a bit about the implementation of EOF, uh, EIP 5450, which was stack validation. And the whole motivation behind EOF is that if we increase how we, if we uh, standardize data in our headers across the execution layer and how we handle uh, contracts specifically within the EVM, we can actually reduce the number of checks we have to use at runtime, so the EVM can run a little bit leaner and meaner. Um, there's a bit of a fallout between Aqua and Reef, and so while Aquila got deprecated, I wasn't able to translate directly into Reef. So I transitioned my project into uh, Ethers RS. So what I did with Ethers RS was actually combining event handling with write operations to the blockchain. So the first thing that would happen is you would instantiate your contract in your provider, and then you have a trait. So traits in Rust are shared behaviors across different types. And say you have the approval function from ERC20, right? You would create a structure that is that effectively mirrors it. There are some declarative macros you'll throw in, and then you'll be able to throw in your contract instance, your function selector, the arguments, and it will run you through. So the first thing I do when I get into the function body is ask, hey, what block are we at? And so then I'll be able to tell how many blocks have passed since I have made that original call. In the middle, I make the call to the function on chain used in JSON RPC. And lastly, what I'll then do is make the separate call to the events try to then get the event from the try. And lastly, I'll wait the six blocks to ensure that there are no short-term reorgs and that we have been successfully included into a block. Um, the next steps for this will be using Wasm MindGen to be able to port this over to JavaScript and Python as well. I've been talking to some of the maintainers of Web3PY for this. Um, on the other end of things, I also wrote one of the first field improvement proposals um, in support of our bustling layer two ecosystem. Um, what I have proposed is that you, so there's a, the big difference between uh, fuels execution layer and EVM is the UTXO set versus a non-spaced account model. And so uh, coins are added to the ledger in such a way that it's in the UTXO set and not in contract state storage. And so what I want to try and do is enforce consistency um, between how we handle all sorts of assets on that ledger. So my suggestion was, we have a contract ID, which we can use to derive asset IDs in the UTXO set. And there was no way to uh, select specific UTXOs. I didn't want to have to use SAT selectors, kind of like you're doing in ordinals. Might have been a little bit sloppy. So I decided to take some inspiration from how Cardano took an approach to including NFTs in the UTXO set. And given Fuel's unique architecture, what I ended up doing is we can apply a bitwise operation to the contract ID, and then we can use that to derive a unique ID to interact with the individual UTXO being produced from that set. And so that is the specification for that. And my, my main uh, reasoning behind even implementing this in the first place is that it's very nice to have standard behavior so that both the developers uh, working on the application layer and the developers working on the protocol layer have high levels of consistency, and that behavior is not broken between uh, similar types of actions you can take on chain. Um, the last thing I've really done around here was some research on vertical trees and the implementation of vector commitments. And so my idea in the research I'm continuing with is separating out the individual vector commitment from the different polynomial commitments. So the motivation behind this is if we need to use a vector commitment that's binding, if we separate out the polynomial commitments, we can actually batch them together. And as a property of the type of polynomial commitment we use, if it's hiding, we actually don't need to enforce that property at the level of the vector commitment. 
So our individual polynomial commitments are just uh, commitments about data, but the vector uh, adds the additional layer um, in terms of uh, position-wise commitment about that individual data. So I think we can knock off some individual terms for the vector commitment if we are able to successfully batch together all these individual polynomial commitments. All right, yeah. Thank you. <laughs>